Well, welcome everyone. Um, We're here to discuss a serious and important topic, but I could not pick two better people to discuss it with. And so we're um, thrilled to be joined by Rob Muga and um, Thomas Abt to discuss what is going on in the United States versus the globe regarding murder. As many of you know from the intro, the murder rate rose in America by 30%, almost 30% in 2020. It was possibly the largest increase ever in our history, or at least since 1905. They changed the stats in 1905, so it's a little hard to know. It rose again less, but still on an upward trend last year. Um, and this is really not what's happening in the rest of the world. The rest of the world, we are seeing problems with um, gangs and organized crime and other things growing, but it doesn't look like the United States. And in the United States, while the media is focused on the crime rise in, in blue cities, and that's a real thing, um, we're also seeing extremely high rates um, in rural areas. The greatest increases have been in rural states like South Dakota and Montana and Kentucky. Um, and, and a number of other places. So this is really a national phenomena. It's not just in our cities. And um, we know that these criminal issues are connected to much bigger issues. We're going to talk about the micro level, the policing, the meso level, but also the macro, the, the political zeitgeist, our democracy, what these things have to do. And get better. So we're joined by Thomas Abt. He's a senior fellow with the Council on Criminal Justice, probably the premier place or one of the premier places um, to, to look at the United States in a nonpartisan, thoughtful way and, and look at our crime. And he chairs the Violent Crime Working Group of the Council on Criminal Justice. He's also a senior research fellow, or he was, sorry, a senior research fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School where he studied and taught and wrote on evidence-based approaches to address violent crime and public safety. He's been in the public sphere, leader, leading offices in the New York governor's office and the office of um, justice programs at the US DOJ. And he's the author of Bleeding Out, um, which is about the devastating consequences of urban violence and what we can do to stop them, deeply evidence-based way of looking at what we can do to, um, to address this violence. Rob Muga is the principal of the SecDev group. He's also the co-founder of the Igarape Institute, which is kind of a think and do tank. It works on data-driven safety and justice reforms across Latin America and Africa. And his research spans the entire globe. And also most of the issues involved with security writ large from arms control to stability ops, crime prevention and violence reduction. So um, Thomas will focus us in on the US. Rob will pull us out. He also advises the global parliament of mayors. He tends to write articles. As I think of an idea, Rob has written an article about it. Um, and he started life as a research director at the Small Arms Survey. And so they're both very, very uh, data driven. And I think many of you know me already. I'm a senior fellow here at the Democracy, Conflict and Governance Program in Carnegie. I look at rule of law, security and governance. And I look at post-conflict countries, fragile states, and also our own US of A, which I've been focused on a lot for the last couple of years. And I've written a number of books um, about, about these problems here and across the globe. So I want to start by level setting. I just want to lay out the problem so that we're all starting from the same place. At the beginning of COVID, there was a lot of worry about domestic violence increases and violence against children. We've seen that. We've seen that globally. But we also saw that crime actually dropped all around the world, maybe because everyone was home. It was harder to commit crimes or because of the um, bans on going out in certain places. Some deeper analysis showed that organized crime was growing and benefiting from the lack of the government as government was pulling back, organized crime was stepping up to provide services and so on. They were recruiting unemployed adults. But in a lot of places, things seem to be getting, um, in the short run at least, a little bit better. So Rob, can you talk about the global scope of, of where we've been over the last couple of years, where we are right now? And then Thomas, I'm going to turn to you to say what's been going on in the US. So we've all got the same idea. Rob. Great. Th thanks so much, uh, Rachel. And, and so good to be here with uh, you and Tom, two people I really admire and, and have uh, tremendous respect for um, and, and like uh, as, as good friends. I, I mean, I suppose I'd start by saying it, it, it certainly feels more insecure, insecure doesn't it? I mean, I think uh, the world has been riven by uh, pandemic related insecurities. We have uh, a hot war in, in Europe. We've got simmering conflicts. Um, in, in other parts of the planet. We've got relentless shootings in the United States. Um, I counted 20 in the last week alone. Uh, and we're seeing in surveys from Pew to Axios to Gallup um, that Americans in particular are feeling more fearful. Um, violent crime and gun crime right now rank amongst the top five problems below inflation and healthcare, but ahead of 
schools, immigration, unemployment, and uh, surprise, surprise, COVID-19. When it comes to the global panorama in terms of hard trends on homicide, I suppose my, my starting point, and forgive me for this, but I have to say it, is that it's mixed and that we're still in fairly early days and really understanding what were the outcomes uh, of COVID-19 in relation to, and the associated restrictions in relation to violent crime and particularly homicide. The last major global review was done by the UN Office for Drugs and Crime back in 2017 and estimated something in the order of 464,000 homicides, many fold higher than those people killed in war. Um, I think though that from what we see from the early indications of data that we're collecting through our homicide monitor, which is a, a large repository of data that's publicly available, um, is that the rates are relatively similar today as to what they were uh, two years ago, albeit probably even a bit lower as you were suggesting. Um, and so we're processing data from 2020 and 2021 Obviously, we don't have very good, reliable cross-sectional data for 2022. But before I describe the big picture, I think it's worth just mentioning that historically, homicides don't necessarily jump after big pandemics or even big fiscal shocks. You know, Steven Pinker and I wrote about this a couple of years ago, that we didn't see violence shoot up after the 1918-1919 Spanish flu. We didn't see huge amounts of lethal violence after the Great Depression or big financial crashes. We see protests, we see domestic violence, but we don't necessarily see these big spikes in homicide. So let me just try to give a quick panorama of what I think is the variations and fluctuations over the last couple of years. I think the short story is that some small states saw big jumps in homicide because of a small number of events. Some big states saw very, very modest increases, but by and large, most countries from our data saw declines. Uh, and that continues a relatively longer term secular decline. As we're gonna to discuss today, US was with a big outlier. I won't say much about that because I'm sure you and Thomas are gonna go into some detail. Suffice to say, we saw a fairly spectacular increase in violence in 2019-2020 um, from 16,000 to 21,000 homicides. Um, these numbers are staggering relative to other OECD countries, but actually the rate, the prevalence rate of homicide is still lower than, than many Latin American countries uh, and others around the world. The U.S. isn't alone in this big spike in homicide. Um, some of the data that we're generating shows that Chile saw a 28% increase between 2019 and 2020. Guyana, small country in South America, saw a 16% increase. Ecuador, which has been in the news lately, saw a 15% increase and an 87% increase last year, although uh, Chile fell back in 2021. The biggest drops in homicide are from interesting places. Um, El Salvador, a country historically at the top of the tables, saw a 44% decline in homicide in 2019-2020. Honduras saw a 28% decline. Venezuela, if you can trust the numbers, want us to be very careful with this saw a 28% decline. Uh, most places though, saw things more or less stay the same. Brazil and Mexico saw slight increases. Um, and it's harder to say what happened in, in places like India and Nigeria where the data is really short. So just to give you a panorama, I'll hand over to Thomas perhaps to go deeper on the US side. Thanks so much, Rob. So Thomas, the US is a big outlier. What, what are things looking like here? Oh, you're muted. Sorry about that. Uh, at the outset, it's great to be with uh, with you, Rachel, and you, Rob, um, and uh, and to be with such important thinkers on these important issues. So, to the question um, at the council, uh, we published a series on crime trends, and we convened, as you noted, a violent crime working group to look at these specific issues. And just to begin with, I think there's three basic issues or facts that are important to understand about this recent surge in violence here in the United States. First, the increase in homicide occurred all across the country. In 2020, 45 of America's large, uh, 50 largest cities saw increases in murder. And in 2021, 32 of these same cities saw increases. But homicide didn't just spike in large cities. It also spiked in mid-sized and small cities as well. And there was really no area or region of the United States that was spared. The second thing to remember is that the nature of deadly violence in the US didn't change much during the pandemic. It just intensified. If you look at the demographic factors associated with homicide, such as age, gender, race, ethnicity, and so on, they didn't change much during this time. And the same is true of geography. Violence got worse where it was already bad, and it didn't spread much to new areas. And then the third thing is, I think, just to place this rise in violence in context. While this, uh, while this year to year increase in 2020 was historic, and there's been a much more modest increase in 2021, 
Uh, it's important to understand that we are nowhere near the all-time high crime rates of the late 80s and early 90s here in the United States. Uh, and that while there we've seen this massive surge in, uh, in gun violence and homicide, uh, property crimes are not following suit. Uh, we're seeing actually uh, modest declines in those. So those are the three basic things to understand about what's happening here in the U.S. Your point about the 80s and 90s is worth taking. That was my childhood. And um, when I grew up and started looking at these trends, I thought, what the heck were my parents doing letting me out on the street all the time? And we ran wild in Alaska, which had very, very high levels of, of all these things actually across the states. And I think that gets a little bit actually to who is the victim of these crimes. And so as part of this level setting, I think it's worth stating um, who the victims tend to be, geographic concentrations, things like that. Because the reason my parents let me run wild in Alaska during the highest rate of violence our country has probably ever known is because it wasn't hitting people like me. Um, and so, uh, Thomas, can you speak a little bit to the U.S. demographics and Rob to the, to the global and the geographic spread? Sure. Um, here in the U.S., the surge in killings was driven by community gun violence, meaning violence committed in community settings using firearms. This type of violence concentrates in our most disadvantaged uh, urban areas, and it's usually happening between young men who don't have a lot of opportunity or much hope. Uh, community gun violence is the single largest cause of homicides in the United States, and as mentioned, that didn't change during the pandemic. It might be surprising for some to hear this, but the number one victims of violent crime in America are Black men. For young Black men and boys, homicide is the leading cause of death, and it causes more deaths than the nine other leading causes combined. Yeah, I, I suppose on the, on the global side, just to follow on, um, and why why was it maybe starting also from your 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 point, Rachel, about why was it your parents let you run wild? Um, I, I suppose it's worth underlining, and we'll get to this in detail over the course of the conversation. That the the places and the people uh, matter fundamentally, and this is really a mantra of Thomas. Um, places with higher levels of concentrated disadvantage, uh, with more social and economic stress, tend to be more vulnerable. Uh, to its higher prevalence of most forms of violence, frankly, and people uh, from marginalized community uh, who are exposed to repeat incidents of violence, who are exposed to dangerous behaviors, dangerous peer groups, huge issue, tend to be more at risk. And I think this is a, an invariant sort of phenomena. You'll, you'll see this across time and place, whether you're in Rio de Janeiro or whether you're in, uh, you know, uh, downtown Juneau or whether you're in uh, Boston, right? So, Let's break it down for a second. I mean, the built environment, so the, the spatial distribution of communities, um, the conditions of households, even the design of buildings um, tend to have a potential factor in shaping the risk of or reproduction of violence, including lethal violence. And there's a whole sub-discipline that many of the listeners will know about called CIPTED, you know, Crime Prevention Through Environmental Design, based around how understandings of geographies influence opportunity and behavior. Um, so typically in, in your city, Violence will be hyper concentrated in very specific neighborhoods, even at the very specific street corners, uh, even within specific households. And so I think it's really important to understand that because that gives us hope when we start thinking about uh, solutions and responses. We also tend to see violence concentrated amongst poor areas, as I mentioned, with higher levels of stress, um, hyper concentrated, even in times of day, you'll see violence being concentrated. Um, and the second point I'll mention, I'll stop here, is that as Thomas mentioned, violence is, is really, lethal violence in particular, is really a young person and a young man's game. Um, the vast majority of perpetrators and victims around the world tend to be young men between 15 and 29. If you take uh, Americas out, like all of Latin America, North America, you tend to see violence concentrated in higher demographics between 30 and 44. So 80% of homicide victims in the Americas are men and boys, four times more men dying of homicide than females. And so it's not to say that there isn't, uh, well, the point here, I think to emphasize is that there's a, a strong gender dimension uh, to violence, um, and that the, the higher the number of killings, the wider the gender gap you tend to see. And this is usually explained by a higher incidence of collective violence or gang violence. In some countries with low homicide rates, that gap tends to be lower. And that's about that persistent intimate partner violence, which is, tends to be a, a little bit harder to deal with, or at least different to deal with uh, than collective violence. So I'll stop there. Terrific. And I'll just add that for, for women, of course, rape tends to be a bigger issue. And so where we see the um, homicides increase, 
we often see rape, but we can't get good numbers on it in many, many countries because people don't report, because yeah. police aren't trustworthy and so on. But um, it's important to recognize who's dying and why. Now, when we talk about community gun violence, young underprivileged men, it seems like an issue of poverty. And the easy finger to point is, oh, you know, the socioeconomic problems here, trauma between generations. But I wanna get a little bit deeper. I wanna talk about the micro causes, the meso causes and the macro causes. So, you know, we can, fill, and because that also gets us to the micro, meso and macro solution sets. Um, you know, we tend to focus on um, policing reforms or maybe we focus on urban and spatial reforms at the meso level or children um, having access to trauma informed care so that they don't perpetrate ongoing cycles of violence. But there's also a political zeitgeist issue um, and issues of how the politics of a country are um, dealing with these problems, whether they care, whether they're addressing them, whether they're exacerbating them um, through inequalities um, and so on. So let's turn to causes. There are a whole lot of theories out there, um, you know, from kids out of school causing trouble in 2020 when the schools closed, police not policing in the wake of BLM protests, increased psychological stress. I know in my own household, um, there was a some daytime drinking while trying to um, teach our child kindergarten via Zoom, plus uh, run my, do my job. So Thomas, what's your best assessment of what's causing the problems in the US right now? Um, and then Rob, I'm gonna turn to you both for the US and, and globally. Sure, uh, you know, uh, understanding crime trends is a very challenging business. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's hard to say with confidence, but I'd say there are three leading explanations that most experts seem to agree on in terms of what caused uh, violent crime to spike during the pandemic. The first, of course, is the pandemic itself. The U.S. response was problematic from the start and the pandemic disproportionately impacted that those people who were most at risk for violence. And at the same time, the institutions that we rely on to respond to violence, the police, the courts, community-based organizations that work directly with individuals, all of these institutions were at least tempor temporarily compromised by the pandemic as well. The second thing uh, that happened is, uh, the second factor is the social unrest that followed the brutal murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis. If you look at the crime data in the United States, you see a noticeable surge in, hom in homicide immediately following uh, that incident. And that violence is not, is not actually associated with the protests itself. Again, it's happening in America's most marginalized communities. Uh, the theory behind what's happening there is that ultimately uh, highly, uh, highly publicized incidents like this uh, really compromise the trust that people in general, but import, most importantly, people in these marginalized communities where violence concentrates, have in the police. And when a wedge is drawn, di driven between police and the communities they serve, violence flourishes. And one of the core reasons that is so, and you know, uh, Rachel, this will resonate. Uh, you talk a lot about this in your in your latest book, is uh, is that the oldest function of the criminal justice system is the nonviolent resolution of disputes. And if people don't trust the system, they don't use it. And so they take those uh, conflicts, they try to handle themselves, some turn violent and even deadly. And then third, of course, uh, is quite simply guns. Uh, in the United States, we saw a massive surge of legally purchased weapons in the United States. The US already had more guns than adults uh, at the time, but now we have even more. And there were a lot of first time gun buyers uh, in this new population. Normally, uh, we see the time that it takes for legally purchased guns to eventually make their way into the wrong hands. They're either lost or stolen and things like that. Uh, it usually takes a number of years to see those, uh, those legally purchased guns end up being used at crime scenes. But unfortunately, during the pandemic, possibly because of a significant increase in first time buyers, we saw that many more legally purchased guns fell into the wrong hands within six months or less. And so it's impossible to really understand what's happening in the United States without also acknowledging guns. Thank you. I think um, the gun issue is really, I, I look at it with political violence. America has um, vastly more guns than the next uh, highest state, which is Yemen, according to the small arms survey, Rob's old stomping grounds. 
um, Yemen, of course, is at war. There hasn't been that much co correlation between political violence and guns, but we might be starting to see that too. Some of these things might be changing with all these first-time buyers um, and different demographics of first-time buyers. Um, so Rob, you said that there are a handful of places, Chile among them, that have um, spikes that look somewhat similar to the United States. And so I'm wondering if you could speak particularly to Chile because it is somewhat similar to the United States in terms of being fairly developed, upper middle income, a democracy that's had some unrest. Do you think that the kinds of explanations that Thomas is offering for the US hold there? Are they different? Is, is there another level we should be considering? On the question of Chile, um, it's interesting because it was an anomaly as well. Uh, uh, and we were surprised because Chile in, in Latin America historically has been in the lower quintile when it came to uh, crime generally. Um, what's interesting is that there was a spike and then a dramatic adjustment the next year back to where it was before. So in a country where you have a relatively small population, uh, a, a relatively small number of events can create a disproportionate impact on the overall percentage growth. So I, I think in, in, in Chile's case, um, it's hard to say there's, you know, what exactly explains that particular move, but the overall trend line tends to be fairly steady and declining. Um, on the issue of just guns, and I want to react to also the macroeconomic factors, just building on what Thomas had said and what you were, how, how you set us up. Um, and this is a particular interest of mine uh, going back 20, 20 years. Uh, the U.S. has always stood out as, as being uh, an extraordinary in its, in its civilian gun possession. I mean, as you said, it's the highest in the world. One in three Americans claim to own a gun. Four in 10 Americans say they live in a household with a gun. That's skewed, by the way, politically. Uh, Republicans tend to own more and claim to own more than, than Democrats. Uh, personal protection is seen as the number one reason and motive as to, buy, as to why people buy guns, which is a very significant issue, which is distinct from other parts of the world where often sports shooting or it's hunting or it's other factors that shape and conditions people's resort. I think what's changed are two things, just to build on your points. Number one, there were uh, almost 40 million guns sold in the last two years, the United States, handguns, pr predominantly handguns. And that's what we're talking about. The assault rifles take up a lot of the headlines, but actually people are killing each other in greater numbers, far greater numbers of handguns. Um, and these we're talking about, and you alluded to it, but untrained, unrestrained, inexperienced gun owners, uh, often first time gun owners. Um, incredibly though, in the United States, unlike virtually any other place in the world, uh, bar Yemen or Afghanistan, we don't keep track of these guns in a particularly good way. We don't know what happens to lost guns very well. We, we, we don't understand how these guns move across uh, state lines, much less international borders. Um, and the US sees guns as a right, right? Not a privilege, like in 192 other countries. Um, and so what's discouraging with the United States is that in spite of these extraordinary high numbers of homicide and gun-related homicide, right? 79% of homicides in the United States are gun related. The average globally is about 40%. In the OECD, it's 20%. Is that the, despite the fact that most Americans are for stronger gun legislation, over 53%, which by the way is a decline from 60% in 2019, that's significant, um, we still see legislation loosening in many parts of the United States uh, rather than hardening as it is elsewhere. So it's really important uh, not to minimize that. Um, if you want, Rachel, I can talk a bit about the macro factors, but maybe I'll hand back to you. Uh, to, to guide us forward. I'll, th I'll throw out some yeah. macro factors because that's where I sure. wanted to go. And then um, please come in, Rob. Yeah. Um, you know, I grew up in a house, not just with a lot of guns, but we had bullet making equipment in our basement. My dad thought that was a fun hobby and we would go skeet shooting and so on. So there are guns and there are guns. And I want to talk about that political level um, because I think it really has an impact. You know, the United States is this outlier in part because European countries um, had this aristocracy. They didn't want commoners to have guns. They, um, the monarchy and the aristocracy basically stripped guns from the commoners as a way of, you know, hundreds of years ago, as a way of dealing with um, the worry of that threat. Whereas in the United States, we needed guns to um, deal with wild beasts, as in Alaska, but also to, um, you know, have self-protection. So there became this really tight correlation between white male gun ownership and citizenship. Um, and having a gun and being a citizen. And you still see that. Now we see that in polling um, with uh, more far-right individuals who have a uh, higher salience of um, minority threats who still see a, a real strong correlation between having a gun and being a citizen. And that affects our gun legislation and so on. Um, also, we have these trust issues. You know, Thomas was alluding to this with um, policing and, and the lack of trust in policing. I think people in America don't necessarily realize that our trust has been going down since the 70s and since the Vietnam War and Watergate, but it hasn't been going down uniformly. 
starting in the Obama years, what we saw was a real sharp differentiation between black and white trust. So white trust bottomed out in the Obama years, um, especially among the older generations, the, the big voting generations, whereas black trust rose. And since then, it's been going in opposite directions. So when black trust is up, white trust is down. This is incredibly problematic from a policing standpoint, also from a governance standpoint, because we know that if you don't trust institutions and you don't trust your fellow citizens, it's the biggest correlation with violence. Um, Randy Roth has this fabulous historical study called American Homicide. He looks back to our founding and he looks at all these different causes and the number one correlation with homicide is trust. There's something about this political zeitgeist when people stop trusting, they stop using the institutions, they take to their own you know, stand your ground laws and so on, you can do this yourself. And we're certainly seeing this kind of vigilante violence, this take it, um, take it upon yourself to deal with your own problems not just in the white communities where you see that um, sort of legislation, but also in the African-American communities and minority communities where people feel like they've been abandoned by the police for a very long time, haven't been, you know, the clearance rate now, Thomas, correct me, it's below 50%, right? The murder, uh, solving murder rate is right around 50%. So half of people who are committing murders are getting away with it. Um, that's a big issue of accountability and, um, and what one thinks is possible. Um, but I want to turn back to you, Thomas, to talk a little bit about this political level, this legitimacy level, and how you think that's playing into the violence here in America. I, I think that we're facing a, a crisis of confidence in America's criminal justice system. And I worry that it is uh, you know, undermining the very sort of rule of law. And I think that you're seeing uh, this challenge play out at the micro level in uh, you know, uh, poor communities of color, but you're also seeing it play out at the macro level. I think that you're you know, with the uh, January 6th insurrection uh, and with uh, you know, the horrific violence that we're seeing, um, uh, uh, hate violence that just happened just this weekend in, in Buffalo. Um, and so I think, it, it, I think in some ways uh, it's all connected. You, I mean, at sometimes you have to disaggregate to really drill down uh, and I, very much do that in the area of community gun violence. But we also have to ask the big questions. And I think one of the things that we re that I really worry about is that um, we are seeing a massive amount of criticism of the criminal justice system from the left. And we're also seeing a massive amount of attack from the right as well. And ultimately we need a system that everyone uh, believes in. But I actually, I think that we have to be careful about sort of false equivalents. I do think that sort of, that sometimes the sort of progressive critique of America's criminal justice system goes too far. I'm certainly not a supporter of abolitionism or defund or things like that. But we have a really pernicious strain of uh, sort of autocratic nationalist thinking on the right that worries me even more. Um, Rachel, we've talked about the constitutional sheriff's movement and things that are really questioning just the fundamental principles of rule of law here in the United States. Thomas, can you spell that out? Because I know what you're talking about, but not everyone else will know about constitutional sheriffs. Well, there's there's a, uh, a small but growing uh, 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 movement of people who believe, who have a bizarre interpretation of the constitution that believes that, cons that sheriffs somehow have, have the authority to sort of in to independently interpret the Constitution in ways that are unaccountable to, to anyone. That's probably not the best explanation. But the thing that's not that's scary about that is it's not just, you know, fringe people in the public. It's sheriffs. There are members of law enforcement who believe this. This is a very dangerous, dangerous thing. And I'm worried about extremism, not just out in the uh, in in the you know body politic generally, but within law enforcement as well. So we're seeing a lot of different threads sort of falling together. Thank you, Thomas. And I want to put a pin in constitutional sheriffs. I want to come back to that. So um, please remind me, Rob. I want to turn to you for macro factors, and then we're going to look at solutions. And by the way, we'll also be opening it up to questions. So please start sending your questions in. Savannah, who is behind the scenes here, will. Um, will moderate them for us and get them to us. But Rob, I'll turn to you for uh, macro factors and then we'll all turn to solutions. Yeah, no, I, I think just on, on the on the gun issue, we don't need to kind of belabor that one because there's more ink spilt on that than probably, you know, and certainly more that we can cover here. But 
But I think that the, the distinction in the United States is compared to other parts of the world is that the gun issue is often presented as a sort of a binary. You have or you don't. There are laws or there are not. Um, it's become uh, the, the idea of reasonable or responsible regulation has become uh, somehow tainted. And, and the politicization of the issue and the, obviously the, the abundance of money for interest groups uh, means that, uh, it, you know, it's become an electoral a, a issue, a winning strategy, which I think is 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 unlike many other places. We're starting to see that, by the way, in Brazil, where the sort of discourse of the NRA and others are starting to kind of arrive. Um, but it's it's very much a, a, a United States phenomena, with some very limited exceptions. I, I think just when it comes to macro, I think one of the, the really important uh, issues to mention, and it bears re repetition, is that obviously homicide isn't isn't monocausal. Uh, there are multiple risk factors at play, and we're often searching, seeking to divine. Uh, the root cause, a term I really don't like, uh, which I think is, is somewhat misguided. Um, it's better, I think, to speak about the correlates of violence um, and maybe the convergence or the multiple risk factors that seem to have compounding effects. And I think in the United States, what you're describing um, and what we're seeing is that many United U.S. cities and towns are facing a kind of storm of economic pressure, you know, wage and, and, and inflationary pressures, political polarization, which you described, rising mistrust of authorities, Thomas's point about the, the justice institutions, massive increase in gun acquisition, a huge mental duress, which you alluded to, Rachel, in the beginning. Um, you know, remember, the United States leads the world uh, in reported uh, <laughs> COVID deaths. Uh, so all of these factors, I think, change. Now, the good news is, is that no condition's permanent, right? We see high violence countries become less violent. We see low violent countries become more violent. There are reasons. Often we have to enter into strategic bargains and deals uh, to avoid that kind of exp you know, explosive violence, some of, some of which are unpalatable. Um, and we'll come back to that, I'm sure, in the solution section. But let me just outline very briefly a couple of quick factors. I think youth bulge matters. And this wasn't always the case. Structural changes in society since the Second World War have shown the relative size of the youth population tends to be a predictor of violence. And the societies get older, you tend to see less violence. This is more applicable in low violence societies and high violence societies, but I think it's a factor. Youth education, unemployment, low school attendance, low quality jobs, uh, typically are risk factors. Civilian firearms, we've already discussed at great length. Alcohol um, and substance abuse. You know, very strong connections between alcohol perpetration and victimization. About 40% of all convicted murderers had alcohol higher than the legal limit alcohol levels in their blood while or during precipitating a crime. Um, and finally, I think the last two that I really want to just underline, which will come back again and again around the world, are income inequality. Um, again, contested, but there's a fair bit of research suggesting that where you see higher levels of Gini inequality, um, you tend to see increased levels of violence. And that's, again, invariant across race and ethnicity. Uh, and the World Bank has found this as a predictor in many different contexts in which it operates. So it's not a uniquely U.S. phenomenon, but it's less abundantly clear in Europe or sorry, in, in, in lower income countries and in, in, in Asia. And finally, the, the low, the low uh, rule of law. Um, and you alluded to this, uh, I think, very clearly, Rachel, that the trust in police and criminal justice, uh, their capacity to deliver, issues of over and under policing, all these matter. And when you measure imp not just the, 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 impunity, the clearance rates, um, you'll see that you know, in many societies where we have high levels of violence, less than 5% of homicides tend to result in a conviction. Uh, and so as a result, the opportunity costs uh, are, 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 are that much lower. So I think it's the combination and the clustering uh, that I think we have to understand and get our heads around rather than focusing on a single unitary cause. I think that's absolutely true, Robin. You used to have this great graphic, you probably still do, that had um, maybe six causes in it. It was like a circle um, and, and you would sort of go through all of them. And I thought that was a really good way to present it. But as we move into um, solutions, you know, a number of the things that you're talking about here are impossible to address youth bulge, you know, let's all have less babies 20 years ago. Um, some of them are hard to address. You know, we've all seen the attempts to move the U.S. gun policy. Um, it is moving in the opposite direction. Actually, we're now seeing women and minorities buying guns. That didn't used to be a demographic that bought them. So, um, so uh, that is hard, not impossible. Um, inequality, also hard, not impossible. We did deal with our inequality after the Gilded Age, but it took a gigantic political movement. Um, to address the trusts and the, the ways in which um, government regulation had been affecting the economy and allowing that inequality to fester in, in Latin America. Of course, a lot of the violence is intended to hold on to that inequality. You have um, corporate violence and uh, business violence and environmental violence in order to ensure that some people stay on top and other people can't 
um, can't make money. So I want to turn to you, Thomas, to look at, um, based on CCJ findings, what are some of the causes that we actually can address? What are some of the um, things that are amenable to change? Because we have, as you said before, had much worse violence in the, in the early 90s and late 80s. Um, I know it's fairly confusing why that came down. It's still pretty disputed why that came down. But it is possible to bring high levels of violence down. And Rob, I'm going to ask you to talk about Sao Paulo and some of the places that you've worked on where much higher levels of violence have come down. So, Thomas, if you could say some about what we know can, can solve some of these problems um, in tandem to address these different causes. Sure. Um, so I think there's a bad news, good news story here. Uh, the bad news is that due to the obstructionism in Congress, there's not likely much we can do about these issues at the federal level to make our country safer in the short term. Uh, but the good news is that at the local level, there's a lot that we can do to keep communities safe. And uh, at the council, we outlined uh, top, our top 10 strategies that, uh, for cities to save lives right now. And I'll summarize them uh, as quickly as I can. Uh, first, you know, cities need to get focused and set concrete goals for saving lives. And we believe a 10% annual reduction in homicide is an ambi ambitious yet realistic target. Second, cities need to get educated. In every city, as we've discussed, violence concentrates among a surprisingly small set of people and places. And cities need to start their work with a rigorous analysis to find out specifically who those people and places are. Third, Cities need to create a concrete plan for engaging these highest risk people in places, and not just with law enforcement, but with treatment and services as well. And you have to choose strategies that are backed up by actual evidence of effectiveness, not just ideas that sound or feel good. And fourth and lastly, you have to place responsibility at the top with the mayor or the county manager. Every city suffering from high rates of violence needs a permanent office dedicated to these issues that reports directly to the mayor or manager and those offices need to be properly staffed and supported. Thomas, before we leave you, I want to hone in on a couple of more concrete actions that I know you've studied in other places, things like cognitive behavioral therapy, um, focusing on hot heads as well as hot spots, um, and uh, talk a little bit about what those actually look like in, in practice and what we're finding that might be a little uh, surprising to people who aren't deeply in this field. Sure. So I think one thing to understand is that violence is perpetrated uh, largely by people who have already experienced violence in the past, and that violence traumatizes them and makes them hypervigilant. So one of the things you're going to need to do if you're going to properly address this is address that trauma and that the problematic thinking and behavior that comes from that. Cognitive behavioral therapy is an evidence-based way of doing that, and it has some very promising results. And so one thing to understand is that even with the highest risk individuals, there are things we can do uh, short of arrest and incarceration uh, to turn, the, turn their lives around. It won't work for everyone, but it will, will work for some. But I want to stress that there's no single strategy, hotspots policing, focus deterrence, street outreach. There's no one strategy that all by itself is going to turn a city around. And that's why you need this planning process and this focus process of saying, we're going to need two or three interventions, all working together, some from law enforcement, some not, to work together. Terrific. Um, I want to talk about focused deterrence in a little bit. But first, uh, Rob, I want to turn to you and some of the things that you've seen work internationally. I know Igarape has partnered with a number of, um, of policing interventions, citywide interventions in Sao Paulo and so on. So can you talk a little bit about what makes for a successful reform? Um, where you've seen it work and how? Yeah, I, I think just to, and I will, and I think to underline the point that we, and we've we've covered some of this ground, but we do know increasingly some of those underlying factors that are more likely to uh, result at the micro level, the, the sort of level Thomas is describing, it's sort of city scale, that are more likely to to to, to result in violence. And I think it's by targeting on some of those risk factors and enhancing the protective factors that we're going to see. Uh, more success. You know, at the environmental level, it's inequality, unstable neighborhoods, delinquent peer groups, et cetera. At, at the personal level, it's adverse childhood events, bad parenting, substance abuse. Even biologically, we're learning more from neurobiology and, and neuroendocrine uh, functioning, what, what's shaping uh, the, the nature of violence. So I think the good news is, from, from our experience at the Institute, is that actually we can achieve fairly big drops in high violence countries and settings. Um, 
you know, and, and reducing collective violence, that is violence between gangs and others, can actually result in major declines in the overall homicide rate. And I, we're focusing here on lethal violence. It's rather harder, however, to chip away at that interpersonal and domestic violence, which tends to be more persistent. So I think one of the big challenges is we can get it down pretty quickly, sustaining it and getting that extra mile uh, typically is a little bit harder. Um, the other good news, I think, and Thomas has alluded to it, and Rachel, you've mentioned it, is that we are getting better at knowing what works. Uh, there's an abundance of evidence of good strategies. There's a uh, infinite number of platforms now, uh, you know, showing the, the what you know the, the, the most successful solutions. But if I were to recommend um, to our you know different cities and different states at the subnational level what works, I would first focus on violence prevention and reduction as a goal in and of itself. It doesn't mean you can't have co-benefits. Doesn't mean you can improve education or reduce, um, you know, uh, other forms of health related issues. But it does mean you have to focus on it and, and show your wins, uh, have incremental wins, communicate them. Um, too often, violence reduction is an add on to an existing project or, or program. And we have to make it, I think, central. And Thomas's point about a dedicated service, a professionalized service devoted to this, I think is really spot on. Related to that, you have to set a plan. You need targets and indicators. This is really basic stuff, right? But if you if you don't have clear KPIs, you can't really know what you're measuring. Um, and you need to have sustained leadership, contiguous, multi-term leadership, uh, and able to get the kind of results you want. The second point I'd mention is to stress the focus and investment on high-risk uh, places and high-risk people. Um, you know, and there's an abundance of strategies, everything from green spacing, quality housing, uh, improved lighting, safe streets, data-driven analytics. Um, you know, improving socioeconomic conditions. Again, not grand poverty reduction strategies necessarily, but very focused programs uh, on youth employment, uh, workshop, you know, workplace development. Um, you know, third, I would focus my strategies based on data and evidence. Um, in Rio and Sao Paulo and other cities, I worked in Bogota, Medellin. One of the key ingredients of success was building out a capability to not just grab and store and manage and visualize data, but to analyze it and build problem solving approaches around it and adapt your strategies as the realities change. This is really, really important. Too often we set a, a goal and we stick to it independent of the you know, changing factors on the ground. Um, and then finally, I put a really strong emphasis on youth and school-based programming, including uh, targeted therapy um, with cash potentially, positive parenting, mentorship, internships, um, educational support. The goal here is to create meaningful changes in the lives of young people to reduce the uncertainties that often result in this kind of hyper-aggressive uh, behavior. You know, violence reduction is often a product of self-restraint, right? And peer-to-peer and -peer socialization. Think of Norbert uh, Elias's sort of civilizing uh, process, you know, the idea of self-control, sympathy, empathy. Um, and so I think really focusing on those younger people who are more, most likely to have been or to be involved in, in, in a violent crime, I think is where you're going to get your biggest bang for your buck. I just want to underline that because I think when we talk about violence reduction strategies, um, it can sound very, very uh, broad. But one of the key goals here is to target, um, not to be too broad, because actually very few people exactly. commit most of the violence. It's a very particular demographic group, but it's also within that demographic group. I and mean, often you'll see cities where it's 20 people committing a great deal of violence. And you can use what's called focused deterrence to say, OK, you 20 people, if you get caught with a gun committing a crime, you're going to go to jail for a very long time. If you can exercise some restraint, you know you can run with your gang and you can do various things. So there's there's ways to focus on just a handful of people so that you're not profiling a whole community. So I think when we're thinking about how do you reduce the violence, which sounds like this very grand thing, the more targeted, the more you're focused on violence, the more you can get it down. And one of the reasons that matters is because of the intergenerational aspect of this, that when people are traumatized, Rob, you said this, when people um, not just com have violence committed to them, but when they see a lot of violence, it can create PTSD. So if you're a five-year-old, six-year-old, seven-year-old boy, and you're growing up and you're seeing um, people with guns all the time, you're seeing people uh, committing um, violence, you grow up with a normalization, but also with a qu quicker um, trigger to a fight or flight mechanism. Um, you're more hypervigilant as it's, and so you're gonna react more quickly harder to tamp that down and have the self-control. So the more you can bring the overall numbers down, the more that six-year-old kid doesn't get socialized that way because they see less, the more they don't grow up into the 16-year-old kid who's committing violence themselves. Um, I wanna talk about how this is done in the US because we've got a question about, um, has this been done in the US? Do we have any cities in the US that have reduced violence? Um, we have some wonderful programs now. Thomas, I think you were telling me about Roca in Baltimore and I've since started a, 
relationship with the Roca folks who are doing just brilliant stuff. Um, but can you talk a little bit about the history in the U.S. of bringing down violence? Sure. I think if you look at what's worked in the U.S. in a sustainable way, there's really no city that's had sustainable success that has either arrested their way out of violence or simply programmed their way out of violence. And I think this is very important to understand. Regardless of your political persuasion, you're going to have to accept a hard truth that there is no way out of this that doesn't involve law enforcement. And there's also no way out of this that doesn't involve non-law enforcement community-based solutions as well. And so uh, that's a very important point, and we see that in cities. If you look at Boston, a city that's had a, a, a long history of success in this area, although somewhat uneven, uh, it started with uh, some uh, of the programs we've been talking about, namely focused deterrence, uh, some key um, uh, faith-based police, uh, police partnerships, and also some important work done in the public health sector. And they had a, a, a number of extremely successful years called the Boston Miracle in the 90s. And what happened is while those official programs uh, uh, you know, went, went by the wayside, people left, things, uh, things changed. It changed the culture of how you govern in Boston in relation to the, this area. And in specific, the, there is a much more collaborative atmosphere in Boston, which is surprising given its uh, history of, of racial strife. But there is a more collaborative approach in Boston. Similarly, uh, you know, our two, two of our largest cities, New York and L.A., uh, we talk a lot about policing in New York. We talk a lot about policing in L.A. But they also have rich tapestries of non-governmental, community-based approaches to give people positive alternatives uh, to violence, as well as the, the work uh, that's being done in law enforcement, particularly in LA with something called the gang, uh, the grid program, gang reduction youth development. The mayor's office took the lead in providing this non-police alternative uh, to, to gang involvement, but insisted that it was closely coordinated with the LAPD. So we do have some uh, examples of success. In New York, of course, in the 90s is one of the ones that always gets gets held up. I want to um, go to police reform and criminal justice reform more broadly because we have a question about it. Please do keep those questions coming. Um, but, but also because I think your point about the left wing solutions and the right wing solutions is really important here that the way you cut violence is actually a combination of both. There's really no way around a combination of both. And the polarization makes it incredibly hard to bring in both. Um, because uh, half of them aren't approved by, by either side of your political spectrum. Um, but when we've seen success and we've seen vast success um, in the US in the 90s, but also in a number of other countries, um, it's achieved by using both these things. It's also achieved, and I just wanna underline this, um, through leadership. I and mean, both of you have talked about having a top level mayor or an executive level and how important that is, this collaborative leadership style. And I just want to underline why that sometimes doesn't happen. I think often because violence is so concentrated among poor, disadvantaged, often minority communities, it's really easy for people to say it's criminals killing criminals and, you know, gangs killing gra gangs. Let's let them kill each other. Um, they might say it outright. When I was working in Bogota, you heard the sort of old style police just saying it outright. Oh, let the criminals kill the criminals. Mexico, the police uh, say it, but also the um President, I'm trying to remember which president, when there was that horrible shooting at a birthday party. Um, maybe it was Calderon. Anyway, Peña he, Nieto, probably. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, but but um, you know, you heard the the president say it, and in fact, that was a middle class birthday party, and you got a lot of uh, pushback saying, "No, right. uh, there's not criminals killing criminals." But you can you can lose that focus when people think, "Oh, it's not that big a deal because we'll let the gangs kill the gangs." It is a big deal percolates through society. And we just have to change that mindset in order to get the top level focus and then the collaboration that Thomas has been talking about so that we can turn to the reforms and policing and criminal justice that I'm gonna to turn to next. But Thomas, looks like you have a point. I just wanna point out that uh, this is, uh, that the type of thinking that you're uh, 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 pointing out is, is not just you know, um, you know, troubling from a moral perspective, but it's just wrong from a self-interested perspective. Ultimately, you cannot insulate yourself from violence by walling it off in certain, in certain communities. It inevitably impacts the overall health of society in a million different ways through taxes, insurance premiums, property values, 
lots and lots of things. Everybody should be invested in reducing violence and promoting peace, whether or not you live in a dangerous neighborhood. Absolutely. Uh, you know, for those of, of our listeners who lived through the 70s and 80s in America, I mean, you could not have a business in a downtown location that was a thriving business or downtowns that just hollowed out. Um, you know, I think it's worth remembering that it impacts everyone. I want to turn to policing. We have a question about policing. And then, Rob, you're on notice. There's a question about international cases of civilian de-weaponization um, that could serve as a, a model for the U.S. potentially. Um, the U.S. doesn't have a, ex, a DSX machina like most other countries do. America comes into other countries and says, we'll give you lots of money and um, help you if you do this, or the U.N. comes in. America won't let the U.N. in and so on. But Rob might have ideas. So on yeah. policing, um, I'm, I'm just going to put that in parentheses because um, we have a question about what role should, should policing and law enforcement play. And I think I, I want to just bring up two separate sides of this. And then Thomas, I'm going to turn to you after I turn to Rob, because there, I want to look at the international and then um, and then the local. So um, in the US, there's been this real gap between the people who are pushing to solve the violence problem. Um, you know, we tend to see that on Fox News. We tend to see a lot of um, desire to, to deal with criminal justice coming from that political perspective, even though there's actually, when you do solid polling, really deep desire in the communities that are hardest hit, which tend to be minority, poor, and so on. But, um, but this desire to deal with the violence issue runs up against the distrust of the police. We talked about the constitutional sheriffs who believe that they have the sole right to, um, to interpret the constitution over and above elected officials. Here in New Mexico, where I live, there are about two thirds of the county um, level that have some, some uh, tie to constitutional sheriffs. Um, but we also have issues of um, crime growing. Voters want more policing. You see pushback because of police brutality. And we get sort of stuck between the police brutality conversation, which is a desire to um, reduce the scope of policing so that it can be less brutal, and a desire to solve the violence problem, which we know has a law enforcement component. So Rob, can you talk first, and then Thomas, I'm going to turn to you about how we do real police reform that both enhances their ability to solve crime and um, police properly while also reducing brutality because this is very common internationally and I think the American audience just doesn't understand that in Mexico and Brazil and so the police brutality is far higher you know in Mexico the police Zetas was a was a thing where the police and the Zeta uh, cartel were sort of put together in a single word um, so brutality much higher violence much higher and yet we have successes like Sao Paulo so on uh, Bogota and Medellin so can you talk a little bit about what we know about uh, criminal justice reform? Sure, um, and may maybe just to say that at the outset that obviously it, it, this is a fiendishly complex uh, topic. <laughs> uh, you know, police and, and criminal justice systems are complex in any society. Um, in in middle and lower income countries, we tend to see them suffering from enormous capacity deficits, rife with interests huge challenges of corruption, sound familiar? Um, you know, and, and so we can't treat them the same from place to place. Each needs to be understood in its historical and cultural context. I just, I think we need to say that. The other thing to say is that the evidence base for what works outside of the United States, UK and Australia is pretty thin. 80% um, of the known research that's been conducted, good experimental design-based research uh, conducted on police reform outcomes is concentrated in just those three Commonwealth countries. So there is a gap. Um, what that means, I think, is we need to approach these things, obviously, boldly, but carefully, um, since it's it can backfire um, and can reproduce actually dangerous practices. If you get police reform wrong, that can scupper chances to do it later um, and, and can reduce the appetite amongst elected leaders and police and citizens if you don't get it right. Um, one example of stuff that can go wrong, I think, is community policing. And I put that in inverted commas because it means a lot of things to a lot of different people. Um, and it's sort of the trope of, of researchers and, and activists everywhere. Um, I was part of a recent study, one of the first that did a kind of cross country assessment published in science last year, um, looking at Brazil, Colombia, Liberia, Philippines, Uganda, looking at community policing practices. And what we found um, was that foot patrols, town halls, hotlines, certain forms of community based police operating in, in neighborhoods did not necessarily increase trust, improve cooperation, reduce crime. You know, and part of the reason for that, it's not to say no to community policing, it's to say that actually it was pretty quotidian issues, um, like the lack of full implementation, the non, you know, not being fully committed, um, the 
complaints of too much or too little policing, uh, the lack of sustained leadership, you know, insufficient resourcing. So I think we have to be kind of mindful that solutions that are often offered don't necessarily yield the, the, the desired outcomes. The final issue I want to mention just before I, I give you three or four examples of good cases is that there is more global awareness about ongoing police reforms, especially in the United States, and police abuses than ever before. You know, the ripple effects of the Floyd killing in the United States had global ramifications from Brazil to Colombia to Nigeria. Like I was in Brazil, there were protests on the street. It ignited uh, a movement, uh, or at least amplified an existing movement around police brutality in that country, which, by the way, has amongst the highest rates of police killings in the world. Um, so in terms of reforms to reduce police violence against civilians, that's your first point. Uh, I think the first is, is to improve, we need to improve data on, on police use of force. Um, you know, this is like, it's so elementary, but despite the tremendous number of deaths uh, occurring in the United States, Brazil, South Africa, the Philippines, you mentioned Mexico, uh, we don't actually have good data sets on police misconduct uh, and it's not a priority. And there's reasons for that, structural reasons for that, which we'll go into. Second, we need to very tightly define and communicate the police activities and functions. Often it's left sort of open, ambiguous. It's the discretion of individual officers. Um, and so clear rules around the use of force, what's permitted, what's not, what tactics are allowed, what's not, are incredibly important. Third point, I think, in terms of reducing violence against, in, in, against communities is professionalization, right? Like basic skills. The success of Sao Paulo, which saw a dramatic sort of 80% drop over the course of a decade and a half, wasn't due to some spectacular new program. It was due to basic skills, cultivating a service-oriented culture, training and de-escalation tactics, prohibitions on excessive use of force. You know, in Europe, um, neck on knee and restraints are banned. They're only used when necessary. That is not the case in many parts of, of the United States. So thinking about the culture of how we organize our policing, it really matters. Um, we need to tighten accountability uh, over, over misconduct and reward good practice. It can't only be sticks. There have to also be carrots, uh, and we have to improve detention practices. Just the final point I'll mention about reform by police um, to reduce violence in, in communities is to support accountable decentralization. Um, so I've, I've already mentioned that you have to be careful about too much discretion, but you need to have decentralization with accountability. Um, rely on proven strategies and tactics. We've already discussed a variety of those. Um, I think we need to avoid those that don't. Latin America tends to go back to Mano Dura. We have this sort of cycle of going back to heavy, militarized, hyper-aggressive, extrajudicial, um, you know, severe penalties, et cetera. They don't work. They're not only cost ineffective, but they don't, they don't work. Uh, and we need to sort of focus on ways of cultivating stronger police and resident uh, ties. The final point I'll mention is the role of women um, and female officers uh, in, in policing. What we're seeing time and time again is that more women in the police force tends to reduce the likelihood of excessive use of force, both within police departments, but also in relation to communities. So ensuring you know, retention of women, um, ensuring practices that allow women to, to thrive and be promoted in police forces is another, I think, critical factor that we've seen uh, as a determinant in places like Mexico, Panama, uh, and Bolivia and elsewhere. Thomas, I want to give you the last word. I wish we could just keep talking. We have a lot to say, I think. But um, police reform in the US, where do you see some um, positive shoots or, um, and also criminal justice reform more broadly? What do we need to be thinking about and doing? Well, I think there's, I think, since we're, my, uh, we're running short on time, I'll just make two very broad points. I think people are generally asking the wrong question, which is with regards to crime, with regards to reform, they're thinking about, should we have more policing or less policing? And that is really the wrong question. And there's really not good evidence about what the you know, appropriate level of policing is. We don't know, and it's not the right question. The question is, is how can we improve policing? How can we have better policing? Uh, every community, every uh, state, every country deserves good policing. And the other, and the other point I want to make is that this is not just about policing; it's also about the entire criminal justice system. Impunity doesn't happen in Latin America just because of the police; it happens because of the entire court and correctional system as well. And, and everywhere, we need to be thinking not about you know, do you know, just expanding the system or shrinking the system, but we need to be about thinking about improving, and as, as uh, Rob said, professionally, professionalizing the system. Well, thank you. Next time, I want to have you back on to talk about training, because we have a whole, you know, there's a lot to talk about there, but um, we will get to that in time. Thank you both so much for joining us. Um, this was a ter terrific talk, and I think the
the end all takeaway is the U.S. is in a bad spot right now, um, really a global outlier bad spot. And we need to recognize that and deal with it. Um, but there are ways to deal with it. There are actually ways to bring violence down very quickly if we have the political will and desire to step out of our polarization and do the things that we have a lot of evidence show works. And well, it's bad for the rest of the world that most of the good studies have been in the United States and other highly developed Anglo countries. It's good for the US that we have those studies. And so um, let's start applying them because we can do a lot at the local level if uh, mayors and counties and so on want to. Thank you both so much. Thank you.